I'm Chantel Murr and welcome to Kicker TV. Today on the show, the southwest coast cleans up from a record-setting storm. Canada's chief climatologist says there's more to come. The old deer and fish plant goes up in smoke, but in a good way. And she's Canada's youngest certified NBA agent. We'll meet Mount Pearl's Stacey Leewood. Climate change is upon us, and this past year could be a good example of what's to come next. When it comes to weather, people in Newfoundland and Labrador are used to expecting the unexpected. But are we ready for what Mother Nature has in store for us next? Wild weather might seem like nothing out of the ordinary to most Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, but extreme weather is a product of climate change. Senior climatologist for Environment Canada, David Phillips, says there are no safe havens from this global issue. You know, you can't stop the weather from coming to you. Uh, even this major atmospheric river that is affecting British Columbia and another one affecting Atlantic Canada. You can't run away from it. Areas on the southwest coast experienced a rainstorm over the past two days like the province has never seen before, breaking the area's 24-hour rainfall record. Phillips says storm intensity and rise in precipitation is going to be the province's downfall in the future. I had to say one particular factor that would be your cross to bear in the future will be higher sea level. Because those storms that can come off the Atlantic, well, they could be more powerful, but certainly because higher sea levels, there's going to be more inundation, more erosion, um, and there's going to be less ice. Uh, so therefore, that ice, sea ice, used to be a great dampener of, of wave heights and, and storms. They couldn't kind of move in because they were covered by ice. Well, when that ice disappears, well, the storms are going to be mightier and more powerful and more impactful. Susan Higdon is the Education Coordinator for Conservation Corps Newfoundland and Labrador, teaching youth in the province about climate action. What, what she says of, the uh, province needs to be see? more aware of what's um, to come. We have a lot of infrastructure, a lot of homes that are built on, you know, near the coast. So if we have more sea level rise or, again, more, more frequency in storms and, and those kinds of events, you know, how are those, how is that infrastructure affected? What kinds of changes? changes we have to make there? How do we prepare? For example, what we're seeing, you know, this week, it's been described as unprecedented rainfall. So, you know, while we've had events like that in, in the past, similar events, you know, are we prepared to have more um, frequent events like that? Phillips says about 85% of money spent on climate change in Canada is all about cutting back on fossil fuels and only 15% on preparing for it. While you can't prevent the weather from happening, he says you can prevent the disaster. You can't run away from it. But by preparing your community, you can, by responding earlier, by building better and stronger, um, you can actually prevent the disaster from coming. As I say, you can't prevent the event, but you can prevent the disaster by by preparing your infrastructure to handle those kinds of things. Even Newfoundlanders and Labradorians, being the weather-hardy people that we are, can't escape the inevitable. I'm Chantel Marin for Kicker News. Last year, a group of local hunters worked with the provincial government to change laws on food donations. This has allowed hunters to donate their big game meat directly to food banks. Now they're holding a contest as an incentive for donations. Kicker's Josh Potter brings us the story. A contest is being held by Share the Harvest NL, a group of hunters who collect big game meat donations for food banks. Barry Fordham is a co-founding director of the group and hopes this contest will push other hunters to donate their game. Anybody who registers and donates game meat through Sharing the Harvest ourselves Every five pounds of meat you donate, or every five packages that you donate, we will write your name on a ticket. But after the, uh, the, the donation closes, sometime in January, we'll draw a, uh, a ticket, and a name on that ticket will win that, that camouflage suit, uh, his or her suit, valued at over $1,000. Just last year, laws prohibited hunters from donating game meat to food banks. The legality said, stated that it is illegal for the meat to have changed hands more than two times. So in other words, I could give it to the food bank, but they were not allowed to distribute it because that would mean it was going to change hands more than two times. 
This all changed in November 2020. Thanks to Fordham's group, hunters can now donate their meats to those in need. With restrictions, of course. The meat has to be processed at a government-approved butcher. So I can't take the meat myself to process it and give it to the food bank. If you don't want to donate to the food bank, consider a senior citizen in your life. For new hunters like Rennie Hines, these morals are how he grew up and how he will teach his kids. That's how uh, I was raised, and uh, you know, if you harvest something, it's it's you know, it's your food, and you don't abuse it, and you still leave uh, lots left for Mother Nature and for others. My son Blake wanted to do this. I said, we're going to do it together, and we're going to do it right. With Kicker News, I'm Josh Otter. A local cannabis company that started in Buren has been rolling out across the province and making waves. It's a success story that's made right here. Kicker Dylan Murphy has the story. The cannabis industry has been steadily growing since it was legalized. For one expanding local company, Oceanic Relief, it's a success story that is entirely homegrown. Taylor Jovanini is the president of the company, which she founded in 2017. I wasn't really educated on cannabis at that point. Oceanic is based in Buren, and all of their product is cultivated at a facility in the town, which is a former fish plant. Jovanini says the idea for the company came to her naturally after helping out a member of her family. It's actually my husband's grandfather. After seeing how helpful it was to her grandfather-in-law, Jovanini made the decision to become a licensed producer of cannabis and form the company. Oceanic's flagship store in Buren, which opened in 2020, was the first drive through cannabis retailer in all of Canada. One of the many things that Jovanini is proud to say sets her stores apart from others. The cannabis industry does come with a stigma, and it, for a reason. So I just really wanted to create a space where people were like so comfortable going in, and ultimately comfortable enough to, to ask the questions that they needed to know, and be, you know, have a... Um, cannabis retail experience rather than just like this quick transaction so we incorporated coffee uh into our business model to just normalize cannabis oceanic currently has five stores across the province with plans to open three more in the coming months charlene sams works at one of their locations in st john's and echoes jovenet's belief in cultivating a different type of experience for customers I think the fact that we have a little bit more education, we educate our customers on what they are intaking. I don't know, and I think the, the whole aesthetic really is different. It's very bright in here, it's very, you know, open, and you don't look like it's, you're like you're walking into a cannabis store. Oceanic's cultivation facility is 63,000 square feet and has the potential to produce 4,000 kilos of product a year. It was a unique idea that garnered headlines when the facility first opened, but Jovanini does not expect to be looking for another plant to convert. It'd be really nice to see that. I mean, I don't see that if every fish plant was turned into a cannabis facility that it would actually be sustainable because we'd have too much cannabis here. <laughs> <laughs> for Kicker, I'm Dylan Murphy. For the first time since March 2020, professional basketball is back in the province. The Newfoundland Rogues are the ABA's newest franchise and they'll be starting their season this weekend. Kicker's Nick Conway has the story with Newfoundland's own NBA agent, Stacey Leewood. The Newfoundland Rogues tip off their season this weekend at the newly named Mary Brown Center. While most of the attention will be on players like Miles Charvis and Luke Doyle, one of the biggest stars will be on the bench giving instructions. Stacy Leewood is Canada's youngest NBA player agent. A Mount Pearl native and former provincial level player, Leewood worked with the Guelph Nighthawks before receiving an unexpected chance to return home. A friend of mine who has a friend who plays basketball wanted to play for the team and he was interested in the logistics. He actually gave me uh, both Jerry's contact and Tony, our owner's contact, and I reached out to them about you know, salary cap stuff, the things that I'm used to with being an agent. And through our conversation, they just realized that I might be a pretty good fit to help coach the team, but also help out with team operations. Jerry Williams is the head coach of the Rogues, an experienced ABA coach 
Williams says the team acted fast to acquire Leewood. They see emailed me asking me, did I need Canadian players? I told Tony about it. Two days later, Tony said, what's the agent Stacy email? I mean, phone number. So I sent it to him. Four hours later, Stacy's my assistant coach. <laughs> it's like, it was the best decision Tony could have made. She's doing everything that I could ask for in an assistant coach. Female representation in basketball, while growing, is still plagued by the same stereotypes. But Leewood doesn't see herself as an outlier. It's not something I ever thought about until people started asking, to be honest with you. But to me, I think it's more of a competitive advantage, more so than it is a negative thing. Because in the entertainment industry, whether it's basketball or otherwise, everybody's doing something to try and be different. And I don't have to try to be anybody, I just have to be myself. I didn't choose this career path to inspire people, I chose it because it's something I wanted to do. Lee Wood is young in her sports management career, and certainly one to look out for. The Newfoundland Rogues start their season with a two-game homestand against the Almira Eagles. For Kicker News, I'm Nick Conway. There's a special CNA connection with the Newfoundland Rogues. Three of our first-year students will be shooting the game, while I will be providing play-by-play -play commentary for all 30 games, alongside Alex Curtis of Memorial University. This weekend is our home opener on November 27th at 7 p.m., and on November 28th at 4 p.m. This will be a two-game homestand against the Elmira Eagles. Now back to you, Chantel. A few weeks ago, we got to hear some music performed by the College of the North Atlantic music students. Megan Breen is one half of the music duo Saving Throw, along with Dominic Flynn. Here's Megan talking with kicker James, James Grudick. I am a singer in the music program at Kona. Cool. So can you just talk a little bit about what music you make and your inspirations? So uh, the first in inspiration that I can remember is I used to always sing Love is Like a Butterfly by Dolly Parton when I was younger. And then, of course, Hannah Montana. I just really wanted to be Hannah Montana. And I mean, Hannah Montana definitely isn't as much of an inspiration now as she was as I was younger. But I don't, it really came from that. And I'm not as much into that music as I am now, but I still, those are like my roots. I don't know, I'm more into more old jazzy tunes now. Old jazzy tunes, yeah. hey? Mm -hmm. Like example? Um, Ella Fitzgerald, Frank Sinatra, I really like them. Um, not even one artist in particular, just mostly that genre. Cool. Yeah. So what do you hope to do with music in the future? I would love to make a music career out of it. Really just getting out and performing and meeting people. Um, it's just really a great experience. Just the connection with me and the audience and I love it. And so can you just tell us what we're going to hear today? So me and Dominic did Valerie by Amy Winehouse, which I love that song. It was such a good song to sing. I just love any songs that I can just belt out. And it was really fun working with Dominic and I think you'll like it. Cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. I am Megan, and this is Dominic, and we are Saving Throw, and we are going to be playing Valerie. And I look across the water And I think of all the things What you're doing And in my head I paint a picture Since I've come home Well, my body's been a mess And I've missed your ginger hair And the way you like to dress Won't you come on over Stop making a fool out of me. Why don't you come on over, Valerie? Valerie. 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 Did you have to go to jail? Put your house on up for sale. Did 
That's it for today's show. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.